Grace, mercy, and peace to you and God, our Father, and our Lord, and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, we have, I have three parallel stories to tell you. Three, three stories with three narratives that, that are very similar. The first one is about Jonah. God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. The second one is, is Jesus calls Simon and Andrew, James and John, to leave your jobs and follow me. And the third story I'll get to later. First, Jesus calls Simon and Andrew. Simon and Andrew were fishermen. Uh, I'm no expert on first century fishing industry, but I think we can, if, if we imagine, we can, we can picture these guys. Fishing is a hard, dirty business. It's one of those jobs that's inherently dangerous. Sometimes fishermen will go out on the sea in the morning, never to be heard from again. And Simon and Andrew themselves were accustomed to spending long hours working on the lake, repairing their nets, handling the fish. Their arms would have been strong, their skin darkened by the sun, their hands calloused and rough from lives lived doing hard labor. Fishing was hard work, but it was a life. Their work earned them a living. And one day, Simon and Andrew were out on the sea doing their thing, catching fish or trying to catch fish, throwing their nets out and seeing what they could catch. And Jesus sees them. And Jesus, he comes up to them. And there's no indication in Mark that they knew each other. Maybe they did. But maybe Jesus was a stranger to Simon and Andrew. And he comes up to them and he says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And who can understand this? But something about Jesus and something about God's working in their hearts or, or I don't know what, for some reason, these two guys look at each other and they walk away from their nets that are hanging down in the water and they follow Jesus. It's like a farmer who's planting his field who, who gets out of his tractor, leaving it running and just walks away. I mean, who does that? And then Jesus and Simon and Andrew go a little bit further along the lake, and they come across another crew that's busy fishing. And Jesus calls out to them, and they do the exact same thing. Immediately, James and John leave their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they join this strange group. How can we understand this radical departure from their former way of life? They may not have known this, but all of them would suffer greatly for their decision. Simon, who Jesus would nickname Peter, would later be crucified while being hung upside down. Andrew also died by crucifixion. James was one of the first disciples to die for the faith. Although he may have gone as far as Spain with the gospel of Jesus Christ, upon his return to Jerusalem... He was beheaded just 10 years or so after Jesus died. John was the only one not to be murdered for following Jesus. Instead, he lived out his long years imprisoned on an island where he wrote some of our New Testament. All of this because God worked in them to believe this radical message of Jesus. The time is fulfilled, Jesus said. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Next, I want to talk about Jonah. Not the Jonah of the storybooks, but the real Jonah. A Jonah who was a man who was also called by God. God told Jonah to go into the great city of Nineveh, to call out against it and say that they're about to be overthrown because of their evil ways. Now, you got to understand about the people of Nineveh. This was the 700s B.C., the people of Nineveh were a, group, a people group called the Assyrians, and the Assyrians had a reputation. If you're curious, you can Google this and find all kinds of gory pictures and, and uh, artwork uh, of, of ancient Assyrian torture. This was their reputation. They tortured people in the most heinous of ways. The Assyrian emperor loved to talk about how he was an eagle who would destroy his, who would rip apart his enemies with his deadly talents. They were a brutal, bloody people who loved to make other people suffer unimaginable torture. 
So you can take my word for it. It's not hard to understand. Jonah had no intention to go to this place. He had every right to be scared to walk up to them and tell them that they're a bunch of weaklings who would be conquered a month from now. Jonah, the name Jonah means dove. And that dove had no intention of stirring up the eagle's nest. So unlike Simon and Andrew would some 800 years later, when Jonah jumped up, it was to go in the other direction. As far as he was concerned, Spain was the end of the earth, and he bought a one-way ticket to Spain, hoping never to come back. Well, of course, you know the story. A great storm arose, and Jonah knew it was because he was going in the wrong direction, and so he offered himself to be thrown overboard that the others would be spared. And quickly, that little dove was swallowed by a great fish, and he was carried back to Nineveh. And after being spit out on dry land, Jonah marched into the heart of this great, terrifying city and proclaimed his message that God had given him for all who would hear it. He said, yet 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. And a surprising thing happened. They didn't slice his skin off or put him in a room full of ash or anything. For some strange, unknowable reason, they believed him. Actually, the Bible says they believed God. The king of Nineveh arose from his throne, removed his kingly robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat in ashes. And the king ordered a citywide repentance, and God relented of the disaster that he had promised that he would do to them. He didn't do it. All of this because God worked in them to believe this radical message of God through the prophet Jonah. Well, I said at the beginning that there are three stories to share this morning. So far, I've given the first two. God calls Uh, Jesus is called the fisherman, the first disciples. Second, God's call to Jonah. And now I want to talk about the third and and final story. This one's a little bit harder to tell because it isn't finished being written yet. See, the third story is about you and me. We also are people who are just doing our thing when one day we were confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. For many of us who don't remember It happening. It happened in our baptism when we were babies. For others, we were adults when God's word found its way to us and we heard God speak to us. But the message is the same. Repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are called to a life of radical of repentance and radical living, countercultural living. Could you, like Jonah, walk into the heart of a terrible city, godless city like Nineveh? And have the guts to preach God's word to them. That's what the gospel of Jesus Christ frees us to do. Because Jesus paid our debt on the cross, we are free to live a life of service to our neighbor and to God. Through Jesus, we are set free from pleasing man and are free to serve God alone. Or or could you walk away from your business like Simon and Andrew and James and John? Could you walk away from your livelihood, all of your worldly things, to follow Jesus, to even suffer and die for him? That's what the gospel of Jesus Christ frees us to do. Because Jesus paid our debts on the cross, we are free to live a life of service to God and our neighbor. Through Jesus, we are set free from pleasing man and are free to serve God alone. Through his word, God calls us to repent of our own wishes and our own desires and and turn to follow Jesus. Do you have a farm, a business? From Simon and Andrew, James and John, we learn that nothing is as important as Jesus. Or do you have a hobby, an activity that you enjoy? It must never be more important than Jesus. Do you have a job, an income? Let Jesus be glorified through that more than anything else. There should be nothing in our lives that, that does not reflect the radical countercultural hope that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. Everything that we have, everything that we do, everything that we are belongs to Him alone. God has called you and me to faith just like He called Simon and Andrew, just like He called Jonah. 
And through his word and sacraments, he has called you to a radical life of repentance and countercultural living. We have something that the world does not have. We have something more important than anything else this life has to offer. We have the certainty that God has forgiven our sins. We have the promise of life that never ends. And that promise, that hope, that certainty changes everything. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. We rise before the canticle on page 223.